Добрый день, все. А, а, как ваша дела сегодня? Хорошо, молодец, молодец. Меня очень рад, что я здесь, потому что Украина это очень-очень хорошая а, страна. Uh, I have been living here in, in, in Ukraine for about uh, two months, and I, I, I have fallen in love with the people, the, 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 the traditions. Everybody is very nice, everybody is very polite, and I am I'm very happy to be here. Um, okay, so let's do it. So I, I want to tell you uh, a little bit about assessment. Uh, I hope that you guys can uh, like this presentation. I know that Maybe when, when you're thinking about being a teacher, sometimes we think, okay, assessment is this evil machinery that we have to give a student so that, you know, uh, it's, it's, you know sometimes as, as teachers we think assessment is bad, but also uh, it is a necessary thing. When, I remember when I was a, a teacher in the U.S., I started teaching my students, I heard about assessment, I heard about uh, that we needed to, to have a students' scores be higher because it has to do with money, it has to do with uh, a lot of things. But anyway, after, after I was teaching for a few years, I had the, the chance to participate in assessment, in, in high-stakes, large-scale assessment for several states. And then I realized, I understood how complex assessment is. So whenever you see... Uh, your students taking a standardized test such as TOEFL, ILTs, etc. Yes, it may, it may seem a difficult assessment, but a lot of work went into that. It's, it's very difficult to create an assessment, and I really encourage you as teachers, uh, you're going to have a, a very, very long path in, in, in your life as a teacher, but if you get an opportunity to be involved in assessment, in creating assessments, either here in Ukraine, or anywhere in the world, please do it, because you are, going to, you are going to learn a lot, and it's a very satisfying thing, because you, actually, you can be in a position where you can be a teacher, and you can say, okay, I'm going to put my teaching soul into this, and I'm going to make sure I create the best assessment I could do. And this is, again, for, for the kids. Anyway, so I, I'm going to tell you very quickly about a project that I have done in the past, and there is a new trend in, in the U.S., and this is the implementation of formative assessment. Formative assessment is very important because it allows uh, teachers to gather data, to gather systematic data, and then make decisions about uh, how to improve our curriculum, how to improve our teaching. So uh, formative assessment is very important. So you can see my, my definition there. Now, everybody, I assume, here knows or have, have heard about this famous linguist called Gene Cummings. Gene Cummings, if I am not mistaken, uh, he's from the University of Vancouver. He's a very well-known linguist in, in the U.S. He has done a, a lot of very important work. So, as you can see, this is his famous... Uh, quadrant uh, schema for teaching. So as you can see on, the, on quadrant A, we have something called context embedded and cognitively on-demanding tasks. So all of the speakers so far that I have heard, they're talking about communication. They're talking about student-centered approaches. They're talking about uh, having a lot of uh, pair shares, a lot of visuals, connecting with the students, and that is good. That is what we really want to do in our teaching situations. So according to Cummings' theory, he says, the first quadrant, quadrant A, is very important because we can make uh, the delivery of our teaching, we can make content comprehensible, and that is very important. And as we go down to B, C, and D, uh, the tasks in, in our teaching situation become more complex. Now, let me point out to quadrant D. So here you have context, uh, context reduce and cognitively demanding tasks. Uh, and this is what Coming, Cummings, Jim Cummings calls cognitive academic language proficiency. So here we can see things such as a standardized tests, taking a test, uh, using math concepts and, and calculations, listening to a lecture. So 
uh, as you have seen sometimes in universities, we have the teacher, he comes in front of the podium and starts lecturing the students, and the students are supposed to listen, take notes, etc. So that is very cognitively demanding because the, the only visuals that the students have is the, the, the speaker, right? So anyway, so this is my metaphor taken from teaching to this notion of assessment. Um, so as you can see here, uh, when we designed this assessment, this assessment is, uh, was designed in order to assess cognitive academic language proficiency. This was an assessment designed for English language arts classes. Now, uh, a little bit of uh, information here. So these classes in the U.S., uh, obviously in the U.S. we have what we call mainstream students, meaning native speakers of English, but also we have immigrant students, or, what, or you know, what we call ESL students. So we have students from several countries, from Asia, from Europe, from Ukraine, from Mexico, etc. So here the idea is that we design this assessment, of, of course, in English, with the understanding that we're going to have some students who are ESL students, whose maybe uh, English language proficiency is not going to be right at the, at the same level as a native speaker of English. So my metaphor is this. The idea is to use this academic language that strives for uh, high levels of cognition, but instead of just coming and applying, to, applying it to students, we're going to scaffold the delivery of the assessment. We're going to make the delivery of the assessment comprehensible, okay? And that's the beauty of formative assessment. So here you can see I have academic languages moving towards the other quadrant because we are going to provide the context needed for the students to understand how we're implementing the assessment. So let me talk to you about this ELL component that we have in, the, in this assessment. So you can see a funnel here. So basically, uh, there's three circles there. One says UDR. Okay, UDR, for those who are familiar in language assessment, uh, means, well, it stands for Universal Design Review. What that means is that test developers, or even us as teachers, when we're designing an assessment, we must make sure that our passages, our test questions, our items, etc., have to be designed in a general way, in an approachable way that can be understood by different student populations. So, for instance, talk, talking about ELL students, talking about um, uh, students with special needs, etc. So that this is a, a component that is very important in, in assessment. AL basically means academic language, so we are making sure that our test is accurate, uh, that it measures high standards. And in the, in the middle you see national standards. In the US, a few, a few years ago, it was implemented what is called the Common Core State Standards. So now every state in the US has to, has to be bound to these standards. So teachers, no matter if you are teaching science, social studies, language arts, ESL, etc., have to teach towards these standards. So what, this is the metaphor, or this is the point of this assessment. If we take the elements of making the content comprehensible for ELLs in, in our classroom, and if we take, uh, I guess, the elements of, of good of standards, good assessment, and if we make our assessment comprehensible, if we make the delivery of this assessment comprehensible, then we're going to have an English language arts formative assessment addressing the needs of both English language arts students, meaning native speakers, and English language learners. So that's the, the main idea of our assessment. Okay, so now let me talk to you about uh, this notion of linguistic ELL misconceptions. I'm sure you are familiar with this notion of interlanguage. So interlanguage is this concept uh, crafted by all of these linguists, but basically it means that when we're learning a second language, in that process we sometimes tend to borrow 
elements from the first language and we use it in the second language. Sometimes there's something called negative transfer. What that means is that I may, I may use certain grammatical elements from my first language or vocabulary or even pragmatics. I can use my, the pragmatics from the first language, use it in the second language, in a second context, and that leads to pragmalinguistic failure, meaning that if I, if I am communic if I, let's say I am learning Ukrainian, and if I try to talk to you, and if I transfer elements from my first language to Ukrainian, you may understand me, but you, you're gonna notice my, my mistakes, right? And you're gonna think, well, you know, he's learning or whatever, and, and that's, that's fine. So this is the process of interlanguage. Okay, so let me talk now about the rubrics. So our rubrics have three columns, okay? And this is the idea. Uh, the idea is to have the students perform uh, an activity, so they're going to be assessed in a, in a, in a very specific activity according to a specific uh, standard or, or objective. And the teacher is going to, is going to start delivering the, the activity. So actually our tasks look like a lesson plan. It's almost like a lesson plan, but the students don't know that we're, we're assessing them, okay? But anyway, in the rubric, in the first column, we have what we call linguistic interlanguage misconceptions. So these are descriptions that uh, the teacher, when, when he or she is going to assess the student, he or she needs to be aware about what could be the linguistic misconceptions that that particular student could do when being assessed. This also has to be with aspects, aspects of grammar, vocabulary, uh, discourse features, etc. Another one is cultural misconceptions. Obviously, if I am, let's say, if I am a student from Ukraine, I move to the US and I start learning English, I start learning the, the, the concepts there, there's going to be a discrepancy in the culture. So there's going to be a lot of contextual things in the instruction, in the assessment that I'm not going to understand. So I need help with that. And the other one is, are, have to do with misconceptions related to instructional background. Let me give you an example. I was born in Mexico, and then I moved to the US. When I moved to the US and I became a teacher, I was told, you need to teach the writing process. And I didn't know what the writing process was. So in the US, it is a very systematic approach to writing any, any type of writing or essay. So as you know, uh, we start by brainstorming ideas, we start by making an outline, we start by writing a draft, then we edit the draft, we do some peer review, then we produce another draft, and then we get a final copy, and then we have our essay, okay. So that concept, that is, an, that is an instructional concept that I was never taught. In Mexico, for instance, and in many Latin American countries, they don't teach the writing process. So this is something that is very important to be aware. If we're assessing our students, they may not be familiar with the instructional background or instructional concept that you are trying to, to do with them, right? So this is column number two. So in column number two, basically what we have are these questions in order to elicit ELL's thinking around language challenges of the task. So the idea here is if the student is not responding as we want, the idea here is not to penalize the student. As Todd said, don't penalize the student. The idea is to elicit questions that are going to help the student understand what we're trying to assess, what we're trying to measure. So, and these questions, of course, should be tapping at higher order critical thinking skills. Um, so that is my, my column number two. So let me talk to you about column number three. So in column number three, basically are suggestions for different, differentiating instruction so, or, or English language support so here the idea is that based on the assessment procedure that we just implemented, teachers can make annotations about what are the next steps in terms of instruction. What are some maybe accommodations? What are some instructional things that we can do in order to help that student 
in the, in the future. So in other words, this is the formative goal. So uh, another thing could be instructional ideas that may help ELLs achieve an understanding the task. Uh, or basic concepts, sometimes we may realize, okay, I am assessing the student in, pros, in present progressive, for instance, but then I realizing that the student hasn't mastered present progressive. So then my next steps would be to encourage the teaching of present progressive. So that, that's the whole point of formative assessment. Now I want to show you, if you can click on the first one, group presentations, please. Let me give you some background about the task. So the task is basically uh, the, students, uh, the students have read a poem, okay? And they, have, they, they made some annotations and they were supposed to do a presentation about the poem. And the idea is that everybody would present and the rest of the students are supposed to take notes, write down comments for, for those who are presenting, etc. So here you can see, this looks like a, like a lesson plan. I'm, of course, not going to read it or anything. But here the idea is that the students are going to do some presentations about a poem, and then the rest is going to take notes. So I wonder if you could scroll all the way to the, to the rubric. So this is our rubric, OK? So notice that in the first column, we have the, we, we have uh, implemented the, mis the ELL misconceptions. So in this case, it is important to tell the, the, the teachers who are assessing the students that ELLs may not be aware about the, com, about the speaking conventions in the US, for instance. So they may not know the basic principles of content presentations, delivery, how to use uh, hand movements, gestures, uh, uh, our body, how to use intonation, etc. So here the point is that the teacher must be aware that perhaps some students may not be familiar with this. So that's something to take into consideration. So as the, stu as the teacher is assessing the student, then the teacher can ask follow-up questions. So for instance, okay, so I am the teacher and maybe I have a student and I could be asking the, the student, okay, you did your presentation. What do you think went good? What, what do you think went wrong? How do you think you can improve uh, you, the delivery of your presentations? What can you do in terms of gestures, volume and intonation, visual aids, etc.? So these are questions that we're, we, the teacher can be asking the student in order to to help him or help her, okay? And on the third column, we have basically instructional advices for the future. So for instance, uh, students need to be active, uh, active listeners. So that means that they need to be quietly, they need to be sitting down, they need to take notes, they need to, to make sure they, they take notes on the most important parts of the presentation. Also, as you know, in the U.S., the, the teacher expects responses from the, from the students. So it is important that, teach, that students participate, raise their hands, etc. So if I am, a, if I am not an active, uh, if I am a passive listener, maybe we need to teach the student to be an active speaker. So to ask questions, to be participative, etc. Could we scroll a little bit to the next page, please? If you want a, a copy of this task, email me. I'm happy to, to share it with you. But look at this. Our rubric one has all of the misconceptions. For instance, just, just to give you more, more examples, uh, students may not know how to be participative in a group conversation when somebody is speaking. As we know, in the U.S., there is this notion that when we are listening to a, to a presentation or when we are in a conversation, we have, to, we have to know how to take the floor, we raise our hand, we wait until somebody stops speaking, then we interrupt. So some of these things students may not be aware of. Let me give you another example. In different cultures, for instance, in Hispanic culture, in some African-American cultures in the U.S., people are what we call polychronic. What that means is that we could have maybe four people talking, and I am talking to somebody here, and these two people are talking at the same time, and it's perfectly fine, because everybody understands each other, and that's culture. 
okay? But in, in, in other settings, for instance, in the U.S., it's not, it's not correct. So we need to wait our turn, then continue speaking. Um, also, another thing, so I, I want you to, to take a look at this, uh, the third uh, column. We can use this opportunity to, to talk about language. So we can teach students, for instance, how to get, a, to get additional information. What types of questions do they need to ask to give encouragement and showing empathy, etc. I'm going to close here because of the timing, but uh, feel free to email me if you want a, 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 a copy of this, of this task, and I'll be happy to share it with you. And, and again, so don't be afraid about getting yourselves involved in assessment. Assessment is a very uh, interesting field and we need it for our students. Thank you very much.